Okay, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. This is Dr. Kaz, and this is the second installment for the Chapter 12 review. This is a supplemental video. Um, this is to go follow up the previous video in which we were kind of doing an introduction to the nervous system. <clears throat> I'm talking about all the parts and pieces and machinery. Now we're going to actually talk about the overall events that are going to occur in the conduction of a nerve signal, action potential and whatnot. So what we're going to do is we're going to break down each region or segment of the neuron and kind of tell you what is going to transpire there as we try to get ourselves a nerve signal that is going to travel down to the terminal or the very end of our neuron and then we'll talk about the events that transpire there, all right, to transmit that signal to either another neuron or to an effector organ of some sort, which is usually a muscle or a gland, okay? So we're going to start off here in the receptive segment, all right? And our receptive segment is made up of the cell body and everything inside of it and these processes here called the dendrites. Okay, so that's our receptive segment. And basically what's going to happen is a neurotransmitter, some sort of chemical, will be released out of the receptive segment, all right, from another neuron, okay, which we call our presynaptic neuron. And that's going to create a phenomenon in which we call graded potentials. And graded potentials are kind of like the movie premiere or the trailer to a movie, okay? It's short, it's small, all right? It's not going to be, you know, as big a deal as the actual movie itself, all right, which is, in this analogy, that movie is going to be our action potential, okay? So when we talk about our greatest potentials, all right, we are going to be dealing with these small, short-lived changes in our resting membrane potential, okay? And if you recall, our resting membrane potential is the measurement or the actual value of negative 70 millivolts and what's going on at the uh, membrane, all right, in a neuron that's not conducting or doing anything, okay? So this is, we're gonna establish, we're gonna create these graded potentials, all right? We're gonna create these graded potentials by opening up, all right, some chemically gated ion channels, okay? These chemically gated ion channels all right, are going to help to change that resting membrane potential, and we'll get into that. But to do that, to actually trigger the opening of these channels, we're going to need a chemical. And in this case, since we're talking about neurons, we're going to deal with uh, what we call neurotransmitters. And those are going to be our chemicals, okay? And what they'll do is they'll open up these gates, and we'll start to see a flow of ions. Because remember, these gates are ion-specific. Only one type of ion can flow through this gate, okay? So this will be a, a very short phenomenon. It won't be long-lasting, okay? So as these ions are flowing through, all right? Ah. So now, can you grab me a paper towel? Roxy just nudged this. Um, so what we're going to see here is, go ahead, go ahead. All right, we're going to see, all right, the opening of these gates here, all right, and the ions will flow in, and we'll see a change in the resting membrane potential. Either it'll make the resting, the membrane potential more negative, we call that hyperpolarization, or it'll make the resting membrane or the membrane potential more positive, less negative, all right, and we call that depolarization, okay? So in this case, these graded potentials will vary, usually short-lived and local, right? So the changes will be, um, they can be either big or small. And what will determine if it's big or small is the number all right, of gates that we have opened up. So think of it like this. The more gates we open up, all right, the more we're able to change that membrane potential, all right? And as those ions flow into the cell, they're going to move on the inside of the cell parallel to the cell membrane, okay? But unfortunately, all right, 
as they enter into the cell, they got to, uh, it's like swimming in a swimming pool full of jello. Okay. There's a lot of resistance involved. So as those ions move in there, all right, they are going to cause, all right, and move, as they move across the plasma membrane, they're going to experience this resistance. And just like anybody else, you know, like for us, if you've been swimming in this pool of jello, you'll start to get tired. And as you get tired, you become weaker. The same thing will happen here. All right. So this will occur. So that's why it's like when you throw a pebble, I won't say a pebble, a rock into a calm lake. All right. And you see the ripples move away from the area that you threw the rock into. All right. As they move further away, they get weaker and weaker and weaker. And that's because they're experiencing all right, the resistance of the water. All right but it slows down and those ripples start to become smaller and smaller and smaller. And that's what we're going to see with these great potentials. Okay. So ideally, all right, when we're, when we're, when we're talking about our, our neuron, we actually want to get an action potential and an action potential is that nerve signal that's going to run down the cell here. And the only place that we can create the action potential is in this region of our neuron called the initial segment or the axon hillock. Right, that's where it's going to actually start. Okay, and then it's going to travel from the axon hillock all the way down to the end of our neuron here. Okay, but in order to get that to occur, we have to start off by creating what we call those graded potentials. Okay, right, they're like a miniature version of an action potential. Okay, we're going to start the, we're going to create these uh, graded potentials. And we hope that we can get enough of them and we can get enough of them that are strong enough that when they reach this region of the neuron, that they will cause an action potential to occur. And we'll talk more about what an action potential is. Okay. So we need to get a lot of graded potentials. Okay. To, to happen. It doesn't have to be all at once. All right, we'll talk about the different types uh, of, of um, propagation here of these graded potentials. Okay, But we need to get it to, um, well, when I say it, we need to get that resting membrane potential all right, to change to a certain value, all right, the threshold value, which is negative 55 millivolts. We need to go from negative 70 to negative 55 millivolts to actually trigger an action potential. We'll talk about that. Okay, so when we're dealing with our graded potentials here, all right, we're going to talk about what happens in that postsynaptic neuron there, all right? So part of the definition is postsynaptic potentials. These graded potentials are actually going to be these postsynaptic potentials that will occur to try to create an action potential. So there's two types, okay? We have what's called an excitatory postsynaptic potential, what we call EPSPs. All right, and they're going to cause depolarization, which means we're going to make the inside of the neuron more positive. It's going to go from that negative 70 to negative 68, negative 65, negative 55, hopefully. Okay, the other type of postsynaptic potential, all right, is going to be the inhibitory postsynaptic potential. Okay, what we call an IPSP. What occurs with an IPSP is we make the inside of the cell more negative, right? So we're going to hyperpolarize the cell, all right? So we'll see, all right, depending on what neurotransmitter is released, all right, from the presynaptic neuron or neurons, because you can have more than one, okay, depending on what type of neurotransmitter is released, will determine, okay, if we're going to generate EPSPs or IPSPs. And what you can have happen is simultaneously, you can have EPSPs and IPSPs being generated. All right. And so when that occurs, all right, like one EPSP will cancel out an IPSP, for example. All right. Depending on how much of a, of a, of a, of a membrane potential change is occurring. But for right now, think of it like that. Okay. So we'll see in some situations where only EPSPs will be made, all right? In some situations, we'll see only IPSPs. And then we'll see where both are being generated, all right, and they're occurring all at the same time, all right? So let's talk about an EPSP first, tell it in a storybook fashion, 
right? So here's what's going to happen when we get depolarization. Depolarization will occur as sodium enters into our postsynaptic neuron, all right? So let's look at the picture here. Here's our presynaptic neurons, all right? They're releasing their neurotransmitter, okay? We know the story. Oh, we haven't really talked about that story. I, I take that back. I take that back. We'll, we'll talk about all the events that occur here, all right? So for right now, the presynaptic neurons are releasing their, their uh, neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft. The neurotransmitter diffuses across the cleft, binds on to the chemically gated ion channel here. In this case, it's going to be a chemically gated cat ion channel, which is a positive, which is a positive uh, ion, okay? And our positive ions that we're dealing with are going to be sodium and potassium, okay? So this neurotransmitter diffuses across causes the opening, all right, of these cat ion channels, all right? And we know with the concentration gradient that there's more sodium outside the cell. So sodium is going to flow down its concentration gradient. It's going to move inside the cell. Whereas at the same time, all right, there's more potassium on the inside of the cell and less of it outside. So when those channels open up, potassium will leave the cell. Well, here's the thing. More sodium is going to flow into the cell all right, a lot faster, all right, than potassium leaving the cell. So the overall change we're going to see is going to be a depolarization. We've made the inside of the cell more positive, less negative, because of all that sodium flowing in. Even though we're losing some positive charge as the potassium exits out, it's not as much as all that sodium that's flooding in. So we now made the inside of the neuron all right, less negative. So we've gone from our resting membrane potential of negative 70, for example, to negative 68. Well, that's good. That's good. All right. Because again, our goal is to get the, the membrane potential to negative 55. That's our threshold value. Okay. So we have two goals in mind. We've got to get the resting membrane. We've got to get the membrane potential to that threshold value of negative 55. All right but we also have to make sure that occurs in the initial segment at the axon hillock, all right? So if we have, all right, all these gates over here on the far end of the cell starting to depolarize, all right, we've got to make sure that we can generate EPSPs that are strong enough, okay, that can travel from one end of the cell body or from one dendrite all the way or several dendrites to the axon hillock. Okay, so that EPSP is going to move towards the axon hillock or the initial segment. But keep in mind, as it travels towards the initial segment, it's going to experience resistance from the cytosol. All right, those ions, those sodium ions, they're flowing through. They start to move parallel to the plasma membrane. Okay, they start to wear down. They start to lose, all right, their movement because they're experiencing that resistance. And so eventually that EPSP, all right, uh, or that graded potential will start to die down and go away, much like throwing the rock into the water, all right? And the further and further away those ripples get, the weaker and smaller they get until they're not existing anymore. So when we see here in our graph, okay, time is our x-axis, all right? The membrane potential or our voltage is going to be on the y-axis. And you can see here, all right, we've stimulated, all right, the opening, all right, of those gates through the neurotransmitter, and we see all those ions, they flood into the cell, and it changes the membrane potential from that negative 70 to briefly to a negative 68. And then they experience resistance, more resistance, and then that just becomes weaker and it dies and it goes away. Our threshold value is, is negative 55 right here. So we got to get this line up here, and we need to do that in the initial segment. Okay? So that's our goal. So that's an EPSP. What's an IPSP? An IPSP, all right, is going to cause, all right, potassium to exit the cell or chloride to enter into the cell. Now we're dealing with a new ion here. It's an anion, okay? This will cause the inside of the cell to become more negative, what we call hyperpolarization, okay? Similar story here, folks, okay? So our presynaptic neuron is going to release its neurotransmitters. The 
dependent upon what type of neurotransmitter it is, will open up certain gates. So in this scenario, we've got neurotransmitters being released that trigger the opening okay, of the chemically gated potassium channel and the chemically gated chloride channels. Right? So again, these ions are going to move down their concentration gradient. So we know there's more potassium inside the cell than outside, so potassium will leave. We also know, we haven't talked about it too much, that there's more chloride. If you don't know this, remember, banana floating in the ocean, all right? Sodium and chloride are outside the cell, okay? So chloride will enter into the cell because it's going to move down its concentration gradient. This phenomena, all right, is going to make the inside of the cell more negative. So we'll go from our resting membrane potential of negative 70 to our new membrane potential of negative 72. The same thing will happen. The IPSP is going to move towards the initial segment, like an EPSP does. Okay? And the same phenomena, right? As it's moving towards the initial segment, it experiences resistance from the cytosol. Remember, the ions are going to move parallel to the plasma membrane. Okay? And it's going to experience, all right, that resistance is going to die down, like our ripple in the, in, in the pond. Okay? So we're seeing here. Here's our stimulus, the opening up of those chemically gated ion channels, all right, the inside of the cell becomes briefly more negative, hyperpolarized. We're moving away from our threshold value, okay? And so that makes it more difficult to initiate an action potential in this neuron because in some situations, we might, might want to inhibit a neuron, okay? We see it all the time in reflexes, okay? You have a group of agonist muscles which are going to initiate an action, but at the same time, our agonist muscles have antagonist muscles. And that's the muscle group that does the exact opposite. So if you want to do like a, a knee jerk reflex, right, the contraction of your quadriceps requires you to activate those muscles, where at the same time, you have to inhibit the hamstring muscles. Those are the antagonistic muscle group, right? Because you don't want to actually activate the antagonistic muscle group at the same time because then you wouldn't have any movement whatsoever. Okay, so we're going to inhibit one muscle group as we activate the other. So in that situation, all right, the nerve that goes to the antagonistic muscle group, we want to inhibit it. How do we do it? We can generate IPSPs, make it more, much more difficult to stimulate those nerves, okay, move away from that threshold value, okay? Okay, so what we'll see is, all right, we're going to see... All right, these neurons are right, trying to get their IPSP or their EPSP, these graded potentials, to come to the initial segment for some sort of response. Okay? So if we move away from the threshold value, there's not going to be any type of response because we're not going to be able to generate an action potential. So that neuron will stay at rest. It will be inhibited. It will not be able to create a nerve signal. Okay, but if we get our EPSPs, all right, to come to the initial segment and they manage to get to the threshold value of negative 55, then we can get an action potential. So when we get to the initial segment, that's this guy right here. And just to review, going back to this, here's the initial segment. That's the initial segment of our, act, uh, of our neuron. This is where we want to get. All right, all those graded potentials to add up, hopefully, to a threshold value of negative 55, all right? Because then we can create our action potential. That's our goal. All right, so when we get to the initial segment, what we're going to do is we're going to add up all the IPSPs and all the EPSPs. We're going to add them all up. We call that summation, all right? Remember, sum is adding, difference is subtraction, okay? So we're going to take the summation of all the EPSPs and all the IPSPs, all right, and all those voltage changes that occurred from both of these phenomena here. We're going to add them up, okay, here in the axon hillock, okay? And if the sum, all right, has reached the threshold membrane potential of negative 55, here it is, Threshold is about negative 55 millivolts, so that's a difference. Now, difference is subtracting, you know. So if we take negative 70, which is our resting membrane potential, all right, 
subtract negative 55 from it, that's a positive 55, excuse me, positive 15 millivolt difference, okay? That means if we can get the resting membrane potential to drop down to negative 55, then we've reached that point of the threshold membrane potential and we can initiate an action potential. That's our goal, okay? So that basically means we have to have multiple EPSPs and our multiple EPSPs have to be, the sum of those have to be greater than multiple IPSPs, if any were generated. And not only that, if it is greater, then that sum difference has to be at least positive 15 millivolts. And if it is, we will reach our negative 55 threshold membrane potential, and we will have generated at that point in the axon hillock our action potential. Okay? That's our goal. So if the threshold is reached at the axon hillock in our initial segment, then our very first voltage gated channels will start to open up and we will have caused or created or generated an action potential, our nerve signal. Okay? If you're not unsure, I mean, if you're not sure, pause the tape, pause the video. I'm showing my age, pause the tape. Pause the video, re rewind it, and watch what I just talked about for the past few minutes. All right, and keep going over that. So there's two types of summation that can occur here in the initial segment. One is what we call spatial summation, in which you get all these presynaptic neurons from all over the place. Okay, could be a dozen, could be tens if not hundreds, all right, all these different neurons. And they're creating their great potentials. Some will cause EPSPs, and others will cause IPSPs. And so they'll just be releasing their neurotransmitters, creating those graded potentials, and when they get here to our axon hillock, we'll add them all up. Add them, everything up. EPSPs, IPSPs, take the difference of both. And if the EPSPs are greater than a positive 15 millivolt change, then we reach our threshold value, then we get an action potential. If not, if not, say we get to negative 56, ooh, close. That's sub-threshold value. We didn't make it. Nice try. Better luck next time. You don't get an action potential. All right? And the neuron will not change. Okay? So that's spatial summation. Temporal summation is going to involve one particular axon all right, from a presynaptic neuron, and it's just gonna keep releasing its neurotransmitter. It'll keep just releasing its neurotransmitter, blasting that neurotransmitter in one area, okay? And if it does it enough and creates a large enough difference, all right, when we get to the, to the uh, initial segment here, and we do the summation, we add everything up, all right? That change is big enough, all right, that it will generate, it will generate, all right, an action potential, okay? So think of spatial summation, a bunch of presynaptic neurons doing their thing all together. And with temporal, it'll be one presynaptic neuron that just keeps releasing that neurotransmitter repeatedly, bam, 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 bam. All right, it's like pressing a single key, you know, on your keypad. Just keep doing it. All right, one letter gets spelled out on your Word document by doing that. That's what we're seeing here. Ba bam. Okay. All right. So now we're into the next segment here, the initial segment. Going back to this slide here, right here. Now we're going to talk about what occurs here, because our goal again is if we're if we're trying to uh, generate an action potential. All right. Our goal is to get that action potential generated, and then we're gonna talk about how we propagate, how we continue on that action potential in the initial segment. So when we get to the initial segment, we have this phenomenon, what we call the all or none law. Okay, all or none. All right, so if we get to the threshold value of that negative 55, we reach that threshold value, 
we generate an action potential, and that action potential is going to travel all the way down, all the way down our axon. Okay? And here's the awesome phenomena about it is it does not lose its intensity. All right? It's as strong here, excuse me, it's as strong here as when it first started off over here. Same thing. Okay? Doesn't slow down, not like a graded potential. It's not local, okay? So it's going to shoot down the axon with the same intensity at this point as it had here, okay? And so that's going to, we call that the propagation. We'll get into that here, all right, in a few. So that phenomena is called the all or none law. Now, you heard me mention before, if we get close to the threshold, that sub threshold value, negative 57, negative 60, is close. It's close, all right? We did not reach that threshold value, we call that sub-threshold, then those voltage-gated channels do not open. They stay closed. And if they stay closed, guess what? No bueno, no good, no action potential, okay? So keep in mind, we can't change. If we do generate an action potential, we can't change its intensity. Okay, once it's started, it's like pulling a trigger on a gun. Once you pull the trigger and the bullet is fired, it doesn't matter how hard you pull that trigger, you can pull it really soft and it fires the bullet, or you can pull it really hard and it fires the bullet. That bullet is going to leave the gun with the same intensity, regardless of how hard you pulled that trigger. Okay, so that's the same situation when we're dealing with an act potential. That act potential, once it's generated, all right, it's going to travel down the axon with the same intensity no matter how you did it okay if you get to that threshold value of negative 55 cool if you get that threshold value past that say we got to negative 40 doesn't matter you still got to this threshold value that's great but it's not going to change the intensity okay, of how uh that action potential is going to travel down right the axon speaking of the axon we're moving into the next part of our neuron that is the conductive segment that's this guy right here all right here's our conductive segment the axon the axolemma which is the plasma membrane of the axon okay so once we've generated our action potential here in the axon hillock it's going to move into the axon our conductive segment and it's going to travel all the way down to the very end of the neuron right into what we call the transmissive segment or the synaptic knobs or end bulbs okay we'll talk about that in a little bit okay so now we're going to talk about how we get that action potential to move on down the line here all right so that is going to be in our conductive segment so this is what we've been trying to build up to this whole chapter is talking about the conductive segment and the action potential okay so we talked about these terms before, all right, depolarization and repolarization. So an action potential involves both of those phenomena. Remember, depolarization is always followed by repolarization. And if we're dealing with muscle tissue, when you get depolarization of a motor neuron, right, it's going to be followed with a muscle contraction. Right, so keep that in mind, especially when you get into 211. All right, you'll talk about that when you get into the cardiac chapter. Okay, but when we get an action potential, all right, it starts off with depolarization followed by repolarization. Okay, which means we're going to flip flop the membrane potential. Remember, resting membrane potential outside the cell is positive, inside the cell is negative. All right, and it's negative, all right, and its value is negative 70 millivolts. But when we go through this action potential, all right, we're going to briefly flip flop that phenomenon and we're going to make the outside of the cell negative and the inside of the cell positive. Okay, so we were going to see a short period of time where we are going to reverse the polarity of the cell, all right across the plasma membrane. All right, so depolarization. Depolarization is when we make the inside of the cell more positive, 
So what makes the inside of the cell more positive, you might ask? Well, we need to actually bring in a positive ion, a cation. Well, what's that going to be? Ding, 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 sodium. How is sodium going to get into the cell, into the cell? Through some channels. What kind of channels, you ask? Right here. Voltage-gated sodium channels, which means the stimulus that we need to open up these channels involves a change in the membrane potential. Okay? Remember, our membrane potential in a, rest, in a neuron that's not doing anything is negative 70. That's the resting membrane potential. What's going to happen is we get to our threshold value. Now, all right, we're going to create enough of a change to stimulate the opening of these voltage-gated sodium channels. And then a whole bunch of stuff is going to happen, which we're going to get into here in a moment. All right, so after we depolarize the cell and all those positive ions flood in, then we're going to shut that down, stop the flow of positive ions coming into the cell, and we're going to return our membrane potential back to negative 70. So that means we need to make the inside of the cell more negative. All right, how do we do that? One, we close the sodium, the voltage-gated sodium channel so no more positive ion comes in. All right, but now we got to get rid of some positive ions inside of our cell. Well, the only positive ions that are going to be inside the cell that are worth talking about are going to be potassium. Okay, so we're going to get rid of potassium. Potassium is going to leave the inside of the cell, take a positive charge with it, and it's going to make the inside of the cell more negative. Okay, so we're going to open our voltage-gated potassium channels, okay, which means we have to have a change in the membrane potential charge, and that charge will trigger the opening of these voltage-gated potassium channels, and potassium will leave. It'll exit the cell. Okay, and this phenomenon, this depolarization followed by repolarization, is going to propagate all right, the action potential all the way down to the very end of our neuron, to the synaptic knob. Okay, so it's like dominoes. This is what I tell folks. You ever took dominoes and, and stood them up on end and had a whole big line of them? Once you tap that first domino, all right. They're going to keep following. They're going to knock, knock the next one down, which will knock into the next one, which will knock that one down, which will knock into the next one, which will knock that one down. All right. So we're going to see a similar phenomenon here in the conductive segment in the axon and the axolemma, where we're going to see these voltage gated channels are going to open sequentially all the way down to the synaptic knob. And as it does that, it's going to conduct the nerve signal, the action potential all the way down, okay? We call that propagation, propagation. So I wanna go into a little bit more of a detail about this propagation, okay? How do we generate, all right, we've gen generated that action potential, okay? Well, I'm gonna actually talk to you specifically now, okay, about how that occurs. How do we cause that action potential to occur, all right? Well, let's start off here, all right? in our axon, right here, okay? So we've created in the initial segment enough sodium, all right, or, to, or something, en enough of a positive ion, mainly sodium, to enter into our cell that is going to drop that thresh, drop the membrane potential to the threshold value of negative 55, okay? So we're now gonna talk about the first part of an action potential generation, which is depolarization, okay? So let's start off when our neuron is at rest. It's not doing anything. So when it's at its resting membrane potential of negative 70, you can look here at our little picture here, okay? Negative 70 millivolts, okay? So this is our resting membrane uh, neuron. It's not doing a darn thing. All of our channels are closed. Here's our voltage-gated sodium channels. They're closed. We've got a bunch of sodium outside the cell. All right, you got some inside, but a bunch of it's outside. All right, nothing's moving across the plasma membrane. Our resting membrane potential is negative 70. Cool, cool. All right, so now let's talk about what's going on in the initial segment. Those graded potentials are bringing sodium, all right, into the initial segment. All right, that's going to be our adjacent region. 
Okay, so the sodium gets flooded in, it gets to that, all right, that, that threshold value of negative 55, all right, so that sodium comes in from the adjacent region, which is our action, our, our axon hillock, and enough of it causes a change in that resting membrane potential from negative 70 to negative 55. Bang, our very first voltage-gated sodium channel is triggered to open up. And then all this sodium out here is going to start to pour into the inside of the cell. As it pours into the inside of the cell, it's going to spread out. Okay? So as it's coming in, it's going to make the inside of the cell less positive. Excuse me, more positive, less negative. All right? So that's what we're starting to see here in our little graph. Negative 70 all right, millivolts. Then sodium starts to pour in in the adjacent region. All right, it starts to decrease. All right, that membrane potential gets to negative 55, causes the triggering of that very first voltage-gated sodium channel to open up. Sodium is going to start to pour in. And that's what we're going to see here. All right, sodium starts to pour into the cell fast. Remember, you got all these negative charges in here from the negative proteins and the negative uh, phosphate ions that are helping to pull it in. And at the same time, the concentration gradient is greater outside the cell than inside the cell. So it's getting pulled in because of that opposite charges, opposites attract, and there's so much sodium outside, it's going down its concentration gradient. So it floods in fast, okay? So as the sodium is flooding into the cell, all right, it's going to change that membrane potential to a positive value. Look at that. Boom, it shoots up to positive 30 millivolts. And you can see now the inside of our cell is positive. The outside of the cell is negative, okay? So we have flipped that membrane potential, flipped it completely. It'll flip you, flip you for real. Name the movie. All right, usual suspects, by the way. Okay, so what we'll see now, when this value gets up to that positive 30, our voltage-gated sodium channels will start to close, okay, at that positive 30. Now, look, notice here, all right, the only gate that was open to this point, or so, sorry, both gates were open, okay? The activation gate was the first to open. Remember, voltage-gated sodium channels have two gates. They're special that way. Okay, so the activation gate is this little swing arm that opened up. Okay, sodium fly, floods through. Notice that the activation gate is still open, but the inactivation gate squeezed shut. Okay, that's temporary for a brief moment, but it's brief enough to stop the movement of sodium into the cell. So we're going to stop here, that positive 30 millivolts. Okay, so that's going to briefly occur. All right. So this is only going to happen for a brief period of time, all right? So now we're going to, remember, because what I said is these voltage-gated sodium channels are going to open sequentially, okay? So this one, all right, will trigger the opening of the adjacent one here in a moment, okay? So this, is, keep in mind, steps one through four, everything that I just talked about is going to occur and repeat itself in the adjacent region. So as this one opens up, then closes, then the next one's gonna open up, then close, and so forth and so on, as we go all the way back down towards the synaptic knob. Now this only goes in one direction. It's only gonna go towards the synaptic knob. It cannot, I repeat, it cannot go the other way towards the receptive segment, towards the initial segment, the axon hillock. And the reason why is right here. The inactivation gate prevents that from happening. When the inactivation gate closes, nothing can open it back up, all right? No stimulus, no matter how strong, can open that gate back up, all right? The gate only closes briefly, though, but it's just long enough where it prevents the action potential. You need to know this. It prevents the action potential from going backwards. It can only go one way. All right, and that's because of the inactivation state that it's in, okay? Great test question, you need to know that. Okay, so 
let's keep in mind, I'm, I'm going to continue on now. All right, so this gate just closed. All right, the inactivation gate is closed. Our membrane potential is at positive 30. All right, remember, what follows depolarization? You guessed it, repolarization. Repolarization is going to follow our depolarization. Okay, all right, I got you. Let's see how that occurs. Okay, so what we're going to see now, all right, is the opening of our voltage-gated potassium channels. Okay, so following depolarization, we're going to have repolarization. So we're going to see now, when we get to this positive 30 value, we're going to start to see the opening of the voltage-gated potassium channels. All right, and the potassium channels will start to open up, and potassium will leave the inside of the cell, taking its positive charge with it, and that is going to cause, all right, the inside of the cell to now become more negative. And you can see here in our graph, all right, we can see how the line starts to fall back down, all right? So it goes, it starts to become less positive, less positive, more negative, more negative, all right? And that's what we're going to see as potassium leaves the cell, okay? Now here's the situation. Potassium, these channels will stay open just a little bit longer. Okay, they don't slam shut as fast because one, we're only dealing with the one gate there. Okay, so they stay open a little bit longer. So a little bit more potassium leaks out of the cell than what we would like. Because ideally, we want to get back to negative 70. That's our resting membrane potential. That's what we like. That's what we need. Okay, so a little bit too much potassium leaks out. Our value drops down below the resting membrane potential to like a negative 80. What do we call that phenomena? Hyperpolarization. Okay, just briefly, this happens briefly, okay? So we've hyperpolarized our cell. Oops, no problem, all right? When that occurs, all right, then the potassium channels close, bang, okay? And we're still negative 80 for a brief period of time, but that's okay, because guess what? Our voltage gate, now excuse me, our sodium potassium ion pumps are then gonna be doing their thing and that's their job. Their job is to maintain and to reestablish, all right, that um, um, concentration gradient of the ions, all right? So in this case, these pumps are going to pump out sodium, all right, uh, out of the cell, and then pump in potassium back into the cell, and then that will right the ship and bring us back to that negative 70, okay? And this same phenomenon follows what I just talked about with the sodium, the voltage-gated sodium channels. Okay, so the same thing, this whole scenario is repeated all the way down the axon. Okay, same series of events, right? Starts off with the opening of the voltage-gated uh, uh, sodium channels, and then it's followed by them closing, and then followed by the opening of the potassium, the voltage-gated potassium channels, followed by them closing. All right, so depolarization followed by repolarization with a brief period of hyperpolarization mixed in there. So if you really want to understand everything that I just talked about, this figure, figure 1219, is awesome. It's got a nice picture here, a nice graph, but I would start off by memorizing this, or reading through it and trying to figure it out. And it breaks it down wonderfully, all right? It's very, very, it's not detailed, but it's a broad overview. And it tells you basically, all right, and we have it listed here in, in sequential events, event number one, all right, resting membrane potential. Here we go. Resting membrane potential is negative 70. Our threshold value doesn't change. It's negative 55. All right. And so this is what's occurring. Now we'll see the graded potentials here in step two. All right. They start to get generated in the receptive segment. And enough of those graded potentials, right, change that membrane potential, all right, from that negative 70 resting membrane value to hopefully that negative 55 threshold value. When that occurs, all right. All that sodium, that positive ion, is in that adjacent region there, will then trigger the opening in our third event here, right? We'll trigger the opening through that process of depolarization of those voltage-gated sodium channels. And when the first one opens up, game on, game on, because it's then, now it's that first domino. We tap the first domino, they're all going to fall. So when that voltage-gated sodium channel, the first one opens up, 
Okay, all that sodium floods in, boom, depolarization. Our value jumps up to that positive 30. Remember, depolarization is followed by repolarization. So we get to that positive 30 value, okay? Then the closure of the sodium, the voltage-gated sodium channels occur, so no more sodium is entering into the cell. Then we see the opening of our voltage-gated potassium channels. Potassium starts to exit the cell, and it makes the inside of the cell more negative. It's our repolarization process. All right, we dip just a little bit below our resting membrane value. We wanted to get there, all right? We overshot it a little bit. Okay, so we're now entering into hyperpolarization briefly, briefly, all right? But then our voltage-gated potassium channels shut, so all the channels are closed now again, and then our sodium-potassium ion pumps will then get us back to our resting membrane potential, all right, of that negative 70, okay? So that's basically it in a nutshell, all right, when we're talking about our action potential. So again, if you're not sure, I would recommend starting off with this, okay? Learn this, memorize that, and then you can go back and talk about this process here in a little bit more detail, the generation of an action potential, depolarization, all right, followed by repolarization, and what occurs in those events, just a little bit more detail, okay? Try it that way, see what you think. The last part of, of the action potential phenomena all right, when we're in the conductive segment is after an action potential, we have a brief period of time that we call the refractory period, okay? And this is that period of time, all right, after an action potential occurs, all right, when we're not going to have an action potential, all right? Or what I mean by that is, depending on um, how soon after that action potential occurred, we can not have an action potential at all, and then we have a brief period of time in which we can have an action potential, but it's really difficult to, to have that occur, okay? So first refractory period is an absolute refractory period, which means no way, no how, all right, will you have an action potential, no matter how powerful the stimulus is, no matter what, no matter what. And the reason why is the inactivation gate, okay? The inactivation gate, slams shut briefly for about one millisecond. That's a long period of time. Well, I won't say it's a long period of time for neurons, but I mean, when action potentials travel great distances in milliseconds, um, it's, it's a significant amount of time. So, all right, the sodium channels will then close, all right, briefly in the inactivate, inactivated state because of the inactivation gate, okay? And they will not open all right, until, all right, we get to or close to that resting membrane potential. And this is why that action potential only goes in one direction. You can't have it going back up the cell. Screw everything up, okay? We need it to go in one direction only, and that one direction is towards the synaptic knob. And that's what we're doing. All right, now the absolute refractory period is followed by the relative refractory period. Now, in this case, in this case, you can have another action potential. You can't. But unfortunately, all right, now we have to um, ensure that that stimulus is stronger. Okay? We need that stimulus stronger because we're in that hyperpolarized state. Meaning, all right, for that period of time when we're in a hyperpolarized state, using the, the previous example, we're at that negative 80 millivolt value there, okay? So instead of being at that negative 70 millivolt resting membrane potential value, now we're at negative 80. So instead of got, going from a positive 15 millivolt difference, all right, now we gotta go to a positive 25 millivolt difference, see? So now our stimulus needs to be stronger. We have to have a pretty decent sized stimulus for that positive 15 uh, difference, but positive 25, come on now, all right? So we got to get something stronger, okay? And that's what happens in our uh, relative refractory period. So what type of channels are sequentially opened in the propagation of an action uh, of the action depolarization? Well, that's our voltage-gated sodium channels. They make the inside of the cell more positive. 
propagation of repolarization. All right, remember, depolarization is followed by repolarization. So the opening of the potassium channels will follow, all right, the uh, events that occurred when we saw the opening of the voltage-gated sodium channels, okay? All right. Which brings me on to the different types of action potentials that you can have. All right, well, I shouldn't say the different types um, because there's really just the one type that we're talking about. But there's two different types of how an action potential is propagated. The example that I have been using pretty much is the continuous conduction, okay? And continuous conduction occurs in an unmyelinated axon, okay? Myelin is a fatty sheath, all right? That is, a, a, um, it's a fatty sheath of tissue, not tissue, well, yeah, tissue that is wrapped around a cell, okay? And fat acts as a cushion, but in this case, all right, this cell, this myelin sheath is gonna act as insulation, much like a wire, like your charging cord, all right, has the rubber that goes around the charging cord, all right? These axons that are myelinated are going to have myelin that goes around the axle lemma. And it acts to insulate the axon, which I'll talk to you about right now. So pretty much this whole time, we've been talking about continuous conduction. All right, so that's what we're seeing. Depolarization followed by repolarization. It propagates the action potential all the way down. It's a sequential opening of adjacent voltage-gated channels, opening and closings of them. So we see that. All right, but when we get into saltatory conduction, and actually saltatory conduction is going to cause the action potential to move faster, okay? So axons that are myelinated, the action potential travels faster, okay, down those axons. So in this case, what we're gonna see is, all right, your action potential is gonna be generated here, all right, at what we call the node of Ranvier, okay? And that's an area of the axon that is not covered by myelin. So we'll see the same type of scenario. The opening of voltage-gated sodium channels, all right, then they'll close, and then we'll see the, the uh, opening of the voltage-gated potassium channels. Same phenomenon, okay? So depolarization followed by repolarization. But here's the thing, all right? We create the action potential here in the node of Ranvier. All right, and what we'll see is sodium will travel into the axon and it will actually diffuse down the axon. And what will happen is, all right, because the only areas that we see the opening of these voltage-gated channels is going to be here at the nodes. We don't see them quite so much inside, all right, a my the myelinated region of the axon there, okay? This is good because... All right, this myelin prevents these ions from leaking back out of the axon. So they only have one way to go, and that's down the axoplasm, okay? So as it travels down, much like a graded potential, all right, those ions start to experience resistance, and they move slower and a little bit slower. But no problem, because by the time they start to kind of lose a little bit of their speed, it's like if you've ever played Mario Kart, you know, and you pick up one of those turbo boost things and it shoots your cart faster. Same thing here. All right. We're going to see, all right, as they start to slow down a little bit, no problem. We get to another node of Ranvier here, and then we experience those voltage gated sodium and potassium ion channels, and they get that power boost and they shoot down again until they get to the next one. They start to slow down a little bit, no problem. Bang. You get to another one and then you get recharged. So you get turbo boosted, boom, 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 all the way down. This type of conduction is much faster than the type of conduction that you see in the continuous conduction, okay? So nerves or neurons that are myelinated, their action potentials, their nerve signals travel faster than unmyelinated neurons, okay? So saltatory conduction, way faster than continuous conduction. Um, two things that can affect, all right, the, actually, nope, I'm not going to say that yet, nah, because I got a slide for that. I almost jumped the gun here. All right, let's get to the last, oh, no, 
Can you, Roxy just spilled more coffee. I'm trying. Um, so the last part of our neuron is going to be the transmissive segment. All right, the transmissive segment is the synaptic knob. Okay, so our action potential is going to travel all the way down to this structure here. All right, and in this structure here, we're going to see, okay, two new structures, two types of gates and pumps. All right, one is our voltage-gated calcium channel, and we'll also have our calcium ion pumps, okay? So the pumps here are going to pump calcium out of the, uh, of the synaptic knob, creating that concentration gradient of more calcium outside than inside, okay? Then we have our voltage-gated calcium channel, which will be stimulated by the action potential, which causes that change in the membrane potential. That change in charge triggers the opening of these voltage-gated calcium channels. Then calcium can then diffuse from outside the knob inside the cell down its concentration gradient, okay? And when this happens, those calcium ions are going to diffuse into the cell and they're going to bind onto these guys, the synaptic vesicles. Synaptic vesicles are those balloons that I was telling you about, those little um, uh, bubbles that have the neurotransmitter inside. So the calcium will glob onto all these synaptic vesicles. Remember, calcium is positively charged. So when the calcium attaches itself onto these specialized proteins, all right, on the synaptic vesicles, it gives that synaptic vesicle an overall positive charge. Well, remember, the inside of the plasma membrane is negatively charged. Opposites attract, don't they? So those now positively charged synaptic vesicles are going to be attracted to the plasma membrane. And so they're going to migrate to the plasma membrane, fuse with the plasma membrane, and release their neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft. That process is called exocytosis, all right? So the, through the process of exocytosis, the, those neurotransmitters then diffuse into the synaptic cleft and then will travel across the synaptic cleft, all right, and will attach themselves onto the postsynaptic receptors of whatever's on the other side of the synaptic cleft. It could be another neuron or it could be an effector organ. Okay, so the nice thing about this part of the cell, all right, is that we can release different types of neurotransmitters, okay, because neurons can actually make more than one type of neurotransmitter, okay, but only one type can be released at a time, right, and that's going to depend pretty much on the frequency of the arrival of the action potentials at the synaptic knob. Okay, so here you can see basically what I just told you here. A little bit of a story mode picture. Okay, here's what we're looking at here, for example. Um, you're going to be talking about this in chapter 10, the neuromuscular junction here. Okay, here's our axon, all right, synapsing onto all right, some muscle tissue here. And so our action potential travels down, all right, the axon arrives here, okay, at the synaptic knob, causes the triggering and opening of the voltage-gated calcium channels. Calcium enters into the cell. It binds onto the synaptic vesicles, all right? Those synaptic vesicles will then migrate here towards the synaptic cleft, all right? They'll fuse with the plasma membrane, release their neurotransmitter through the process of exocytosis. That neurotransmitter will then diffuse across the synaptic cleft, and it'll attach itself, all right, on to all right, the postsynaptic um, receptors here in this tissue and trigger the opening of these channels for something to occur. Stay tuned. You get to talk about that all right, in chapter 10. Okay, Cool stuff. All right. 
So two things can affect the speed of an action potential as it's traveling down all right, the axon. One, I said before, if that neuron is myelinated, if it has that uh, uh, fatty insulation there, the other one is diameter. Okay, the thicker, all right, the axon is like a water pipe. Think about it. More water can flow through a bigger pipe than it can a smaller pipe. All right, and that's because that there's less resistance involved, much like water flow. All right, same thing for electricity. Okay, so that's what we'll see. Okay, almost done here. Just a couple things about neurotransmitters. All right, um, we're going to use the uh, uh, neurotransmitter of acetylcholine. All right, very popular neurotransmitter, and especially in our class because we're going to be talking about its importance in chapter 10 when we get to uh, muscle stimulation here, all right? So in the peripheral nervous system, we're going to use this neurotransmitter to stimulate contractions in the skeletal muscle, all right? Same neurotransmitter, but when it's in the central nervous system, all right, we're going to use it to help stimulate awareness, all right, or what we call arousal, all right? So, and we will talk about uh, in chapter 13, the different areas of the brain when we talk about the reticular formation and what we call the reticular activating system here, all right, uh, when we're talking about arousal. So more on that later on. But basically, acetylcholine, the ingredients, all right, for acetylcholine are going to be acetate and choline, all right? And so what the neuron does is it combines those together, all right, and, and it makes acetylcholine from these two uh, molecules here, and it stores it in the synaptic vesicles here. So you know the story, action potential causes the release of this neurotransmitter, all right? It is releasing the synaptic cleft. It will briefly bind on to, all right, the postsynaptic receptor, triggering some sort of phenomenon, usually the opening of some gates there, all right, for the movement of ions, okay? And what will happen is, all right, when that's all done with, say there's no more action potentials coming down from the neuron. All right, well, we got to clean up. It's like having a party. You have a party, now it's time to clean up the party, okay? So we released all the confetti out, all right, like on New Year's Eve in Times Square. we got to clean it up, okay? So all this acetylcholine is out into the synaptic cleft. We're going to clean it up. We're going to bring in an enzyme, okay, our, our good buddy here, acetylcholine esterase. This enzyme is going to come in into the synaptic cleft, all right, and it's going to break down acetylcholine back into acetate and choline, okay? And acetate and choline will then be taken up by the presynaptic cell. And it'll get recycled back into acetylcholine, all right? It'll be stored into the um, synaptic vesicle there for the next action potential. So your body's pretty good about that, all right? It's going to clean up after the party, get the dustpan out, and sweep up all the confetti and all the other trash that was laying around, all right? And clear it out of the synaptic cleft, Put it back to where it needs to go. Okay, there's other things like sometimes acetylcholine will just diffuse out of the cleft. There's glial cells nearby and they'll absorb up uh, some of the acetylcholine. Okay, a lot of times it'll recycle it. Okay, it'll take that acetylcholine and just package it right back up. Sometimes it'll break it down and then it will uh, absorb. Or when I say it, the presynaptic neuron will absorb the, the, the ingredients and then it'll make more acetylcholine back in the synaptic knob there. Okay, so there's a couple different ways to get our neurotransmitter out of the synaptic cleft, all right? So the first one here, when we're talking about how we remove a neurotransmitter from there. I just talked about acetylcholine esterase. We got these enzymes there that break it down, all right? You also heard me talk about the reuptake of the neurotransmitter. We're just going to suck up like a Hoover vacuum and suck up that neurotransmitter, all right? Right out of the synaptic cleft, back into, all right, the presynaptic neuron. Or we got our glial cells, all right, that'll absorb that uh, neurotransmitter out of the synapse, okay? So those are the three ways that we can kind of clear up or clean up after our party here, all right? And so we've, we've made certain drugs that will actually affect that, okay, which will help to influence the removal of that neurotransmitter, okay? One of the more popular ones, generation two type of antidepressants, are going to be select. SSRI, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, right? So this group of drugs prevents, all right, serotonin, which is a neurotransmitter, from being 
taken out of the synaptic cleft. It leaves it there longer. So it can influence all right, those tissues for a longer period of time. And we found out that these types of drugs help to treat depression. All right? We've also find out, found out, you know, um, certain types of acetylcholine esterase, that's that enzyme. Remember, anytime you see ASE at the end of a word, that's an enzyme. All right? This drug here, all right, the galantamine hydrobromide is going to block, all right, the acetylcholine esterase from breaking down our neurotransmitter, all right, of acetylcholine, and it stays in the synaptic cleft longer. So we found that this is actually a very useful drug to help treat, all right, uh, Alzheimer's. So here in this picture, you can see a couple, all those three different ways here, all right? So our acetylcholine, all right, it's in the synaptic cleft, all right? We can uh, recycle it, repackage it, and put it back in here, okay, uh, as a whole. Or we can break down acetylcholine into its individual components of choline and acetate, and then we can take it back up into the cell and then put it back together as acetylcholine. Or it can just diffuse out here into the synaptic cleft off to the side and then our glial cells can suck it back up. All righty. Well, that is the end of this video. I hope it was helpful. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, and I look forward to us talking in our next session. So folks, have a great day. Enjoy. Please study hard and enjoy your free time.